Each episode of the Blind Alchemy podcast is designed to be helpful. Expect comedy. Do not expect consistency or sense to be made. I am Podbot. I was inspired by the Lion Goat podcast. Listen to that show. We must apologize for the audio quality in today's episode. There were some technical difficulties. Today's episode continues the interview with philosopher Buck Johnson and the discussion of the fifth hermetical principle of rhythm. Abdul Hassan al an Arab historian, a Swedish doctor in Europe, studied at Oxford. During those times, he became friends with Hunter Pettis, and in the 1920s, an American scientist, Dr. Royal Greenville, the high frequency had been exactly 11 times higher than the low, which is also known as the 11 times higher than the low, which is also known as the 11 times higher than the low. I'm not sure, Big Stone Fox, or Dr. Rock, 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 or D
just far too disorganized to do that. I mean, the only bodies of true organization that I've seen that have been productive at trying to repress this knowledge that humans have created are like religion. That's an idea that has been very productive. And you can just see how disorganized and fucked up religion is. All it does is cause these massive wars and, and things like that. Or, it is used as a supplicant. Yeah, it serves its purpose very well. Yeah, it motivates people and creates patriotic ideas or ideas of like joining and fighting for society and things like that. Other examples of that are like governments. You know, those are examples of mass conglomerations of people. And another example of that is science, you know, the scientific institutions, the institutions of learning, universities, public education. These are examples of greatly accomplished societal. But the idea that there's like a cabal out there that controls the knowledge of physics or tries to keep people from understanding physics or philosophy or religious power or education, I just don't see that there's an organizational structure that would work to accomplish that. Because people can't drive to work in the morning without causing giant traffic jams. We're so disorganized. People are just doing what they're doing. They're worried about getting their coffee and making their breakfast and how are they going to get their kid to school without having a fight about you know, what shoes to wear and they're crying. And I mean, they, they can't organize to prevent people from learning about the reality <laughs> of nature. But, but that's the thing, right? That's the point. They keep us disorganized, distracted, so we don't know who and what we really are and what we're capable of. We can be controlled if we're unaware. But why, what is their goal? What do they accomplish in controlling us and preventing us from knowing the nature of reality? <laughs> But why do we believe that they are doing that? What evidence is there that they are doing that? Nikola Tesla. Explain. Yeah, he created some cool experiments with electricity. That man was shot down at every twist and turn. We live off everything that man did in the 20s today. Our society is based on everything that man did. You're talking about electronics and the conveniences of modern life. Yeah, nobody knows who the fuck that guy is, right? Well, I mean... I will say that he died, he, he, he died penniless. Yeah. All right. Westinghouse, fucking Edison. They all were like, fuck you. We're taking your idea. Get fucked. Yeah. We're profiting off your shit. You're a punk. Thank you. Die. There's no debate that the people that have survived capitalism best or made the most money are the ones that know how to best market and promote mass consumption and create monopolies in the market. It's like Carnegie. Right, yeah, because in a capitalist society, the wolves win and the sheep lose, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why Edison is who we remember as the creator of the light bulb when in reality there were many, many, many people that made light bulbs before, after, and better <laughs> than right. Edison. And Tesla had some great ideas, but there were problems with his ideas. Like the, if we had an electrical grid based on some of Tesla's ideas of how the electrical grid would work, then there would be massive problems with how to control it because he wanted to send massive jolts of electricity through the air, which is very similar to the way our Wi-Fi works now at a much lower amperage and wattage and different frequency, but it would cause like your house to catch on fire if we just shot massive wattage through the air. That's Hedy Lamar. Tell me who that is. An actress from the 40s. Yeah. That's why we have Wi-Fi now. Okay. Tell me more. Her and like three other dudes. An actress. I don't know who the fuck she was hanging out with to be like part of that. They were using it to uh, something with sonar to locate stuff. And she was part of the team that created what we use now as Wi-Fi. An actress. Oh, so we're talking about the signal people in like World War Two, World War One, probably. I don't know. It was developed sometime between World War One and World War Two, I think. And they were using it to locate submarines and planes with radar and things like that. Yeah, they were using it to track submarines. Yeah, okay. I like how passionate you are about this topic. I think it's very interesting. There's stuff that we don't know that we're, don't look at that. Look over here at this thing. 
You know, that's that's how societal control works. So you're saying public education doesn't choose to educate us about that. Like, that's not the concept that they chose to teach us about. No, it, it's essentially the same since it started. Keep the motherfuckers in there just smart enough to keep the factory machines working and fuck everything else. Those that apply some kind of intelligence, let's make them, bring them into the fold of science and let other motherfuckers... It's all indoctrination of some kind. I agree that there are choices made for in, that indoctrination and, and documentation, but that information's out there, right? Like, you know it. You learned it. Yeah, but I didn't learn it through... It's not hidden from you, necessarily. It's... You had to go and find it. You didn't it. learn it in school, did you? No. No, because I think the idea of our education, you have to choose what to teach the children, and you pick the items that are as diverse as possible to allow the children to pursue types of careers that will make them money. Look, they are currently teaching kindergartners about homosexuality. I don't think that's appropriate. Do you? Yeah, I think I think that homosexuality is a reality. Kindergartners don't need to know that. They're teaching those kids. It's a reality of life. Not for a fucking kindergarten. It's it's something that we pretended didn't exist for a long time, and in certain societies. We gotta learn to read. We gotta learn to write. We gotta learn to do math. We gotta learn to do computers. We don't need to focus on sexuality. That's that's not an educational system's call. That's my thought. But, I mean, I learned some things about sexuality in school. I think I learned them too late. I think they tried to teach us about condom use when it was too late. There were already <laughs> kids in my classes having sex before they started to even teach us about condoms. And it, oh, yeah. Well, that was. But I think the ideas of like. We're from a time where they were like, oh, shit, you know, we better start teaching these idiots this because they're just, they're overpopulating the planet. So we better teach them to use condoms. Hey, you say what you want about old oh, I think the main driver around condoms use was like AIDS, don't you think? Yeah, we did do that. Yeah, AIDS was a huge scare during our time. And so they wanted to teach us to uh, try to avoid <laughs> getting this virus that no one understood that would kill you. And that's curable too. Because now it is. Uh, in some ways, it's partially curable or at least treatable. But... The, Not well. The, it's it's curable. Take a look at Magic Johnson. He don't have AIDS no more. He received so many treatments that the number of of the virus in his body doesn't show up in the tests. But there's no the doctor who treated him. It starts his name starts with an S. He's from Africa. He's dead now because he can cure AIDS. And anybody who said, "Hey, I went to this guy and got cured from AIDS." is dead too. All these treatments that Magic Johnson got are publicly available. They're just way too expensive for anybody to afford. They're actually getting much more reasonable these days than they were many years ago. But you used to have to be a millionaire like him to be able to get those types of treatments. But there's actually better treatments for HIV now than, there, than the ones that helped him out. But I think, you know, there's nothing that says that he wouldn't develop more HIV in the future because like most viruses, once you have HIV virus, it's forever. Viruses are mostly forever. Like it's in his body. He's just not producing enough right now to where it's strong enough to cause his immune system to kill him. I don't even know how old that guy He's is. getting up there, maybe 60, something like that. But back to, the, <laughs> I don't know, we're kind of getting off our topic of vibration. Maybe we want to focus more. Well, that's all right. Well, you, you brought up doctors. Yeah, the idea of treating viruses and stuff with vibrations was in part of that video. Carnegie created the AMA, the American Medical Association, right? And specifically told them to denounce and deny the uh, usefulness of natural herbal supplement, that shit, all right? Because medicine comes from a lab, not from the planet Earth. That's the logic, okay? You cannot profit off a cure. So we just got treatments. We don't cure things anymore, we just treat. Editor's note, the blind alchemist is referring to the entrepreneurial contributions made by Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. The influence of these changes to the funding of scholarship for strictly allopathic medical education facilitates has a great impact on the acceptance of herbal, natural, and holistic medical practices, according to Wikipedia. In 1847, the American Medical Association was founded in Philadelphia by Nathan Smith Davis as a national professional medical organization. In 1901, John D. Rockefeller founded the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research in New York City. According to the Journal of the American Medical Association, Volume 72, Issue 2, 1919, and a history of the FDA and drug regulation in the United States from FDA.gov. 
In 1905, the American Medical Association, AMA, began a voluntary program of drug approval that would last until 1955. In order to advertise in the AMA and related journals, drug companies were required to show proof of the effectiveness of their drugs and had to show proof that the drug would treat what they claim. According to Epimuk, 1999, Health United States 1998, with socio-economic status and health chart book. In 1906, the AMA established a physician master file designed to contain data on physicians in the United States as well as graduates of American medical schools and international graduates who are in the United States. Each file is established when an individual either enters medical schools or enters the United States. According to Robert Garner, July 27, 2016, Political Animals, Animal Protection Politics in Britain and the United States. The AMA established the Council for the Defense of Medical Research in 1908. According to Wikipedia, John D. Rockefeller founded the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission in 1909, an organization that eventually eradicated the hookworm disease. His General Education Board made a dramatic impact by funding the recommendations of the Flexner Report of 1910. The study, an excerpt of which was published in The Atlantic, had been undertaken by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, according to The Man Who Invented Medical School, by Jenny Rothenberg Gritz. June 23, 2011. Abraham Flexner was an Atlantic contributor. In 1910, the magazine published Medical Education in America, an excerpt from his report on America's 155 medical schools. Flexner wrote, explaining how a loose apprenticeship system turned into an unregulated industry that churned out rapidly made doctors. Flexner's critique had a sweeping influence on the way medicine was taught. After his report, about half the medical schools in the United States closed their doors forever. Those that met Flexner's strict empirical standards were rewarded with plentiful foundation money from John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. In 1911, in US v. Johnson, the Supreme Court rules that the 1906 Food and Drugs Act does not outlaw false medical claims but only false and misleading statements about the ingredients or identity of a drug. In 1912 Congress passes the Shirley Amendment to overcome the ruling in US v. Johnson. The Act outlaws labeling medicines with fake medical claims that is meant to trick the buyer. Later Rockefeller created the Rockefeller Foundation in 1913 to continue and expand the scope of the work of the Sanitary Commission, which focused on public health, medical training, and the arts. It endowed Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. It also built the Peking Union Medical College in China into a notable institution. According to James A. Schaefer, December 26, 2013, the business of private medical practice, doctors, specialization, and urban change in Philadelphia, 1900 to 1940, the AMA's Council on Medical Education and Hospitals first published its annual list of hospitals approved for internships in 1914. I think what you're talking about is this sort of disparity between the, the capitalistic use of pharmacology versus the sort of Hippocratic desire of the medical field. I, and I, I think there's this sort of delicate and evil dance that plays out in any sort of capitalistic society. I, I think this is a fundamental problem with the idea of capitalism and promoting social welfare through the concept of capitalism, I think it always is going to break down because of greed and envy and man's quest for power and um, man's urge to always have more. You know, I think it's sort of like one of our fundamental survivalist needs is you gotta have enough to get along well. But not all societies are like that. If you develop the principles of social benefit around the society instead of around the individual, and I think you can separate those things. I think you can separate the ideas of economy from the ideas of like the social well-being. Now we will take a break for some advertisements. Please support our sponsors. We ain't got no sponsors. We talking about this whole damn podcast is brought to you by me because I'm the fucking sponsor here. And now back to the show. I think that we used to be much better at that, and that's broken down more over time as we play out this great American capitalist experiment. Of course, there's other capitalist governments, and you know, America's not the only one. But I think Americans especially have a problem with this idea trying to do everything in the same basket it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever that things like medicine and education the prison or the justice system that all that's wrapped up in capitalism i think all that should be completely separate from our economy because it just completely fucks it up yeah <laughs> the prison system should not be for profit that's why we have so many incarcerated people, yeah. In the model of profit. I mean, of course, drug companies want to make money off the drugs they create. They are 
monetarily motivated yeah and, and you know so then there's the argument of like what do you do if they don't make money what you know you have to have some sort of organization of that of deployment of that stuff and i, I you know i think you can set reasonable limitations around that stuff but i think the whole concept of medicine is about how do you promote the well-being of others around you is diametrically opposed to the idea of how do i maximize the most profit that I can get from selling something to someone else. I mean, those things, those two things are fundamentally opposed in the approach to me. It doesn't make any sense for um, pharmacists to make billions of dollars in the mindset of how are we going to help the most number of people. It's like those two things are diametrically opposed. So I agree with you that there's... It's a um, scam. But I don't think it has to be that way. I think there's many examples of societies in the world today or in the past where you watch your neighbor's kids, your grand, you help your grandparents, they live with you, you know, you, everyone lives together and helps out the village and then you all survive because you all help each other out. Yeah. It doesn't have to be about like, I need the most rocks or I need the most Kuka shells, you know, or I need the most gold, or I need the most other fictional economy of dollars or Bitcoin or whatever the hell it is that you think you're amassing. You're not getting anything. None of that is real. It's all just, sure, it helps you play that pretend game better. And if you're living in that. Yeah, it helps you play the, the game of Monopoly, societal. Yeah. Society's Monopoly. Game. Yeah, that's all it really does. And yeah, I mean, if I could have a billion dollars, and I guess we could, technically, if we learn to play that game as well as the guys that learn to play the game, eventually, we could do that. That's not really what I'm all about, but... No, I agree with you. If I could have a billion dollars, I would enjoy riding around, <laughs> doing whatever I want, anytime I want to. But I would also feel guilty because I would know that... Well, you'd have to have to be a philanthropist of some kind. That, that would definitely ease your mind. Yeah. I, I think about that all the time. What would I do if I was like a bazillionaire? The first thing I would do is go around and go to the hospitals and just pay off bills. Just walk in there with like, you know, a million dollars. Like, pff, how many bills will that pay? You know? Elvis did that shit. I think that's a noble effort, but it's a place to start. That's a noble effort, but I think you're, you know, you're aiming too low. If you have billions of dollars, use the billions of dollars to change the entire stupid American medical system to be sociological and treat people that need treatment instead of charging them millions of dollars for that treatment. I agree. I agree. I, pay what you can pay. Here's a pig. If you got a pig, I'll take a fucking pig. Let's go. I got to eat. Pigs are tasty. Bacon is delicious. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's better things to do. You know, people get mad at the billionaires like Tesla or Bezos and stuff because they're doing because they're trying to like, oh, maybe create a, a brighter future for the future of mankind. And they're doing it in the wrong way. Like they're spending their money in the wrong way. A lot of people say, yeah, you could create some fictional society that might be able to live on Mars in the future. But what if you just directed that money at helping people today? And and then there's counter arguments for that too. And I, I'm guilty of this, you know, I think that the population of the earth of humankind is way too high. I wouldn't necessarily want to save millions of people's lives because I think those people are ruining the earth as it is. So maybe we should direct that money into killing off hundreds and millions of people instead of trying to help them survive but I, I you know but at the same time i would want to benefit my fellow human more than i would want to benefit some potential future human beings in some predictably impossible future which won't ever exist but then again you know when you're a kid and you can play with all the toys you want why not play with the toys that you want to play with right, right. so like i can't really hold it against him that he's making rockets and trying to be an astronaut and stuff i mean that's sounds cool and fun too but 
I don't really believe in the idea that it's some noblistic journey for the future that he's trying to help out. I think it's more he just wants to play with the shit that he finds cool and interesting. He's fulfilling an agenda. An agenda? We've had a space agenda since like the 50s. Moon, Mars, asteroid belt. In that order. We've been to moon. Now we're going to Mars. The alleged reason that we don't go back to the moon or haven't been back to the moon is because it's not financially feasible. But we're building shit and going to Mars. Well, we have. We have recently. China went to the moon recently because they just wanted to do it. Well, they they'd never been there. They'd never been there. They had yeah, never done it. That's right. But then I'm sure they quickly discovered the same thing we did. There aren't minerals that are worth much to us there. <laughs> so... <laughs> In order for any of the ideas of going to Mars, though, we're going to have to make a moon base. There's got to be a way to get, because it's way too expensive to launch spaceships off the Earth to go as far as Mars. Yeah, yeah, totally. It would make much more sense to launch them off the moon. I mean, I, I like the idea of going to Mars, and yeah, if we could live long enough to be able to use the minerals that we could mine from the asteroid belt, that could be useful, but I think we got bigger problems that we are going to have to solve before that. I've always wondered why that order. First, we've got to get to space. That's the moon. Second, we've got to prove we can travel a distance. So that's Mars. Then we got to go to the asteroid belt where all the gold and platinum and shit we're going to need is. Yeah, but think about, you know, the one thing that, like you were saying, the public education system sort of fails us on is the concept of the distance to the various planets. We learned that there's nine planets or eight planets, and they're, we learned that they're in this certain order, and we learned that they're relative distances from the sun. But what they don't explain is, like, the journey to Mars is fucking far! <laughs> Is it five months? Is it it's like five, five months, months or something? Five months at a theoretical speed that we have only theoretically created. Haven't achieved yet, yet right. It, it takes a shitload of time is all I'm trying to say. And like, <laughs> once you get there, you know, right now, there's nothing. You, you're just there you're in, and then you die. <laughs> <laughs> And it's real fucking cold, and you can't do anything. I can't go outside. It's, it's cold. And then you can't ever come back because we don't really have the technology to do that yet. We're getting closer. I mean, there are some like ion engines and things. If you want to take a really long time to get back, you could theoretically get back. But yeah, it's like more like three years to get there, and then you're kind of stuck there. But I guess that's the whole point. That's what that's the problem. I go in the first place. I don't understand that. why. Why do we got to go? What's what's on Mars? Why do we need to go, go checking out a dead planet? Other than just wanting to, you know, why climb the Mount Everest? Because it's there. Because we can do it. Because we want to see if we can achieve that goal. I think that that's one answer. And the other answer is, you know, it's that is the nature of man. He always wants to accomplish more and do more and build more. Why space and not the ocean? This is a very... Good point. We now have robots that can explore the ocean in ways that we never could even 10 years ago. And there is a ton of exploration going on right now in the ocean of places and stuff that we've never seen and they're discovering stuff all the time. And it, the problem with the ocean is the same problem we were talking about before with like drilling to the core of the earth. Once you go in the ocean at a certain depth, the pressures become so great that our modern computers they fail because the pressure gets so great it causes the yeah doesn't work the same as you when you put it under great amount of pressure cameras and stuff are really hard to get to work and you can't put any people down there you do all that stuff remotely because the people will die because the pressures there are some amazingly we are able to go amazingly deep now, though. I was watching something about that recently in documentaries made in the last couple of years. They're able to go to some crazy depths now that we could never even conceive of before, even like 10 years ago. Well, that is, yeah, that's very interesting. Because it was like we reached a certain point of ocean exploration and we were like, yeah, we're not fucking with that. Let's go to space. Well, no, I mean, I, 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 I don't think we were like, oh, fuck that, we'll go to space. I think we were like, oh, that's... 
that's this really hard, hard. Let's go. and cost a ton of money. And what you see when you get down there is that it's completely dark, so you can't see much around you. And it's sort of like you're searching for a needle in a haystack. Now we will take a break for some advertisements. Please support our sponsors. Your product goes here. Anything and everything good to say about your product, we'll say it right here, right now. And now, back to the show. Same thing that we find when we go to space, though. You know, the moon is relatively close, even though it's really far away. <laughs> really far away. And then you get there, and you get, we sort of, like, drove around the moon, and we went in, like, a 20-mile radius, and we were like, oh... It's all kind of like anything interesting to see here takes a really long time to find because it's a really big rock. And, you know, there's lots of little rocks here. And then we brought some of those back and did some experiments on them. And we were like, oh, it's all kind of like the rocks we have over there in Arizona. <laughs> but it's up in the sky and it cost us billions of dollars to go and get it. Well, let's just get it from Arizona next time. I'm making jokes, but so let's tie this back together. The monks, you know, they're playing the drums in rhythm. They're playing the horns in rhythm. That's what makes the vibration, the resonant vibration. Well, see, that's the thing. All rhythm has vibration. Not all vibration has rhythm. All so. things that are done in a rhythm create a vibration, I think maybe is a better way to say that. So when we're talking about the ideas of Individuals who will take advantage of individuals who are less educated or less wealthy. I agree that those people exist. Oh, wait, wait. Esoteric and exoteric right there. Yeah, you're exactly right. Exoteric and esoteric, I agree. And the idea that there are oligarchies in the oil industry, and I think that that does absolutely exist. And that there are conspiracies in massive uh, corporations to increase profits. I mean, if you want to expand your definition of conspiracy out more, we can say that any kind of corporation is really a conspiracy. The notion that uh, a company is a body that works towards a common goal, I mean, that's kind of the definition of conspiracy, right? We're all conspiring together to accomplish something, and the, the thing we're trying to conspire together to accomplish is wealth, then yes, there are real cooperative environments that conspire to achieve greater wealth for common causes. I'm not debating that point. I'm debating the idea that there are people out there trying to prevent the public from understanding the nature of reality. I don't know. I think there have absolutely been instances of that in the past, and there probably are today. But I think it, it grows harder and harder as there is the internet and the ability to get the knowledge. I, I don't know. I mean, I really just don't think that unless there's a specific company that gains some sort of specific wealth out of preventing people from learning about the physics of vibration, <laughs> I just don't believe there's there's no reason for those people to be motivated to do that. And people aren't going to be organized enough on their own to accomplish that. It doesn't matter how much money you have denying. I don't know. We did do that with, you know, the Americans did do that with the uh, Native Americans that lived in America when they took over their land. They certainly conspired to steal their land from them and and not educate them and try to force them into a type of religion and society that was antithetical to their very way of life. And, you know, we could argue today has ruined their entire society and caused the ruination of the planet of the earth. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, but I think that that was an unintentional conspiracy, which is my great point about conspiracies. There's lots of conspiracies in the world, but... They're unintentional. <laughs> their intention is it never has the foresight to accomplish the goal that you can look back in hindsight and say, look, all this works out this way in this nice, neat way. See how they 
used this practice over the scope of 30 years to prevent people from knowing this thing. I don't believe that. I think people just did shit and then you can look back at history and you can tell yourself any story that you want to about what happened in history, but you can't really understand history because you weren't there. I don't think it's so much that we're trying to keep. It's more of a co-creation. We co-create reality. So Absolutely. We co-create the story that we tell ourselves about reality. Those that know that feed the story to the minds of the masses to create it the story they want created. Sure. People manipulate other people to get them to believe what they want them to believe. Like Crest wants to sell you toothpaste, so they tell you it makes your teeth whiter. And Coca-Cola wants you to buy sugar water at 100% profit, so they tell you it peps you up and makes you feel good, or whatever. But the idea that there are some sort of collaboration of people that are trying to prevent all of the masses from understanding reality to hold them down so they can have some sort of power over them. Who says they're people? What? Who says they're people? Oh, yes. Okay, the ancient aliens. Let's bring it up. Uh, I'm not saying they're aliens. I'm just saying, you know, who knows? I wasn't there. You weren't there. Yeah. Who says they're not some kind of interdimensional being? Well, yeah, but it's uh, some person that presented this idea to you that there is an, an interdimensional being. Like, it was some person who was like, hey, I want to get clicks on my YouTube video, so let me make up something about aliens and angels and uh, the Masonic... <laughs> the Masonic fraternity who... Who's to say? How do we know? We don't know. Well, we don't know. Well, we know because Sam and Jim can't fucking plan to meet on Tuesday at 7 o'clock to get beer and tacos. It's hard to organize shit. People are just not good at... How would they do it? When, and what would be their motivation? They want to hide the fact that there's aliens? Is that why they're motivated to prevent the people from knowing? I, I don't know. Why? That's a very excellent question. And why we do the things that we're doing today, Buck. <laughs> why is anything what it is? Why are we in the state we are in? Because we're dumb for thinking we're smart, I think. I don't know that we're dumb for thinking that we're smart. I think that, you know, we want to explain the world in a way that makes sense. And we want to be comfortable. And we want to have sex with people we think are hot. We, and we, we want to live a long time and we want to have children that have happier lives than the lives that we've lived and so we create a story that makes us feel good about all that stuff and then there are other people who have insecurities who were not treated well and so they sometimes want to retaliate against the world that didn't treat them well so they do bad things to accomplish goals that maybe give them a sense of power in a world that they're powerless in. I think it's all much more personal and much more specific. That's why I don't believe in the idea of like these great conspiracies or these great organizations of men that hold down other men. Because I think it's either I'm too optimistic or I'm too much of a realist to believe that people would organize to that end. Yeah. The kings wanted to stay rich, so they told the peasants that they were the arbiter of the gods and that the gods spoke to them, and the people believed them, and the people gave them tribute and money and taxes because they wanted to live behind a wall with an army that would keep them from dying when the other roving bands of pirates and bandits would come and try to steal their food. I think that those conspiracies absolutely existed. But I don't know what the advantage of not telling me that Bigfoot is real would give you. You don't have any power over me if I don't know that aliens control the cycle of the moon and the... You see my point? It would make much more sense if it was something more selfish and greedy as a motivation. To believe in a conspiracy like if there was some direct benefit you would have from it well you just you just don't see the benefit yet you know you don't see the reason behind it so you're like yeah well, there isn't one because i don't 
see the reasoning. But who knows what the reasoning is because it's beyond our scope right now. Maybe so, but I would just suggest that men's motivations are very local and they're usually very specific to some immediate selfish goal. I want money, I want food, I want sex, I want to go home. That's basically the needs of man. Right. Yep. That's it. The needs of everything. Not just man. All the animals. Yeah. Unless you get to the level of, like, the bacteria and the viruses, which are really in control. <laughs> and their goal is to make more babies. Maybe that's the master conspiracy. We're really just created by the bacterium so they can have a house. We're not created by the bacteria, but we certainly are their vehicle, man. They, we live to serve them. We don't know it, but they're in our brains, they're in our guts, they're in our indoctrine system they control most of our like motivations like people that love sugar love sugar because the bacteria in their stomach love sugar <laughs> i thought i liked sugar because it was tasty it is tasty but those bacteria you know they manipulate you to want more because they use it up <laughs> and then you got to get more i'm not saying they're totally in control i'm just saying like it plays a much bigger part. We're so woven into the fabric of the earth and all of the microorganisms. You know, we believe that we're like some sort of bubbles that are in control of our own destiny and we're separate from the world. We tell ourselves that story, but there's so much of the world that manipulates us that we're not even aware of. It's not a conspiracy in like the concept of mind, but it, I think it is a rhythm. We are the rhythm of the world and the, you know, the rhythm of the water moving from thing to thing and the rhythm of the energy moving from thing to thing. I think, you know, if energy is life, if energy is, if it is God or whatever it is, we're the rhythms that it moves us in. We may think we have some sort of control over it, but I think energy... It's either entropy, the movement of energy in one form to the movement of energy into a different form. I don't know what that is. I mean, that is the greatest mystery, right? Mm -hmm. What is it that makes the things go? Totally, totally. We may never know, but, you know, we try to understand. And I think that's, maybe we shouldn't. Sometimes I wonder if we shouldn't bother at all. Is there bliss in not trying to know? Maybe, yeah. But it's kind of fun to talk about. Yeah, Fun definitely. To think about. Definitely. That's why we do. Fun to dance to the rhythm. That's why we do these things. <laughs> well, I guess that's it. Uh, next, after this Hermetic Principle series that we're currently on, we may address the 48 laws of power. Oh, wow. 48 laws of power. Might have to find another specialist for that. I'm not familiar. Well, well that's okay. If we, we get another guest, we get another guest. Ted and Patricia are lining up those people as we speak. Got Ted involved? Well, no. Ted. Why would you have Ted involved? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the best choice, that guy. Yeah, he's quite insane. Jesus. He's quite insane. Come talk to Ted today. I no, no, he's, he's passed out. It's a boxing or something he said earlier. Hmm. Well, at least it's not cocaine. Yeah. Did you ever get that hole in the wall repaired? Yeah. In the words of Hunter S. Thompson, once you get locked into an extensive drug collection, the tendency is to push it as far as you can. And I believe Ted is doing that regularly, daily. But each his own. The road of excess may lead to the Tower of Wisdom. Or a massive rock bottom. One may never know. <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't take you down with him. I'm, I've got a feeling that he's going down. Yeah, we tried an intervention last week. Sorry, Ted. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thanks for your efforts. <laughs> Thanks for being there, pushing record. Glad you're here. Stop destroying your life. <laughs> we love you, Ted. Keep it together. <laughs> Come back to us, Ted. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Blind Alchemy Podcast. Thank you for joining us here at the Isle of Mind. I am your host, the Blind Alchemist, and with us today is, of course, the infamous Buck Johnson, philosopher, entrepreneur. You may not agree with the things we talk about, may not even care about the things we talk about. If you do, you do. If you don't, you don't. Like, subscribe, you don't even have to do that. We don't care. We're just here doing this because, well, it's fun for us. And uh, maybe it's fun for you too. Maybe you think about these things like we think about these things. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're just worried about where your next coffee's coming from. I think next we may address the principle of cause and effect. At any rate, we're here 
we're glad you're with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. We would love to receive your feedback, your questions for advice. Please email us or send us a voicemail. Our address is the blind alchemy podcast at gmail.com. Find, like, review, subscribe, and contact us on Facebook and YouTube at the blind alchemy podcast. All one word. Please subscribe to this podcast on your podcast player. We are available on Spotify and anchor.fm slash the blind alchemy podcast. Please tell all your friends, enemies, and any strangers to listen to our podcast. Music was provided by the Internet Archive Collection of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Text-to-speech services were provided by FreeTTS.com and ReadLoud.net. Excerpts were taken from the YouTube video with the right frequency. Anything is possible. Hidden knowledge of vibration. Check out their stuff at YouTube slash Be Inspired channel. We would like to extend a special thank you to the world's greatest musicians, sound designers, and engineers at Hairline Productions for their help with the composition, performance, editing, production, and recording of both the original music and today's show. Please like their content on SoundCloud.